Hello, and welcome to the Geotechnical Engineering Podcast. In this episode of the Geotechnical Engineering Podcast, I'll be talking with Stefan Flynn, a geotechnical engineer in the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, Rock Island District. We'll be talking about flood restoration and his involvement on some major flood projects, such as the Cedar Rapids Project in Iowa and the rebuilding of levees after the 2019 Midwest flooding. I'm your host, Jared Green, and this is the Geotechnical Engineering Podcast, a podcast focused on helping geotechnical engineers stay up to date with technical trends in the field. And with that, let's jump right into today's episode. This episode of the Geotechnical Engineering Podcast is brought to you by PPI, a leader in engineering exam prep for the FE and PE exams. PPI provides expert prep courses and study resources designed to help you pass the FE and PE exams the first time. PPI's live online courses include hours of lectures, problem-solving demonstrations, exam strategy sessions, office hours, and a passing guarantee. When you take a live online course, PPI guarantees you will pass or you can take the on-demand course for free. PPI's reputation and history sets them apart. PPI has helped engineers achieve their licensing goals since 1975. Check out PPI today at PPI, the number two, pass.com to see all the options available for FE and PE exam prep. Again, that's PPI, the number two, P-A-S-S, Dot com. Uh, Stefan, welcome to the show. How are you doing, man? Doing great. Uh, glad to be on. Listen Excellent. to every episode. Big fan. <laughs> oh, that's great. You did your homework. Yes, sir. <laughs> you did your homework. Yes, sir. Oh, that's awesome. Well, we're glad to have you on the show with us. And uh, I want to get right into it. I've read a little bit about you and I'm, I'm curious. I understand that you were a fullback for the fighting. Is it fighting Scots? Yes. Yeah. The uh, Monmouth College fighting Scots. Okay, um, tell uh, me a little bit about that. How did you transition towards engineering? That seems kind of different from football. <laughs> yeah, no. Um, so I guess the uh, the long route is that my my path to becoming an engineer um, is somewhat cir uh, circuitous. Okay. It's a little bit a uh, little bit unique. Okay. Um, going into college, um, I pretty much knew I wanted to be a civil engineer, and you know that's for all the normal reasons, um, you know, being good at math in school, uh, enjoying the problem solving aspects, um, and, you know, wanting to build bridges, right? That's kind of like <laughs> half the, the story for half of engineers. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but uh, kind of what makes my story a little bit unusual is that, um, as you know, for my undergrad education, I did what's called a pre-engineering or dual degree program. Uh, so at Monmouth College, I majored in physics and ended up with a Bachelor of Arts there. Cool. And a portion of those credits were shared with um, SIUE or Southern Illinois University at Edwardsville, where I got my BS in civil engineering. Okay. So kind of the way I like to explain that to people is that I basically double majored while going to two different schools. But so how this worked out, how this ties into football is that you know, Monmouth gave me the opportunity to eventually work towards being an engineer, but it gave me the opportunity to play football too, which at, you know, 18 years old, yeah. that's about the most important thing, right? I, exactly. I get to keep playing. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and I wasn't, exactly. you know, I wasn't good enough to be D1. So um, it, yeah. it all worked out. Um, I guess that's a good point to clarify for, you know, maybe some of our uh, East Coast listeners that, yes, it's Monmouth College, not Monmouth University. Um, okay. It's a private, private liberal arts school in Western Illinois that competes in NCAA Division Three. Very nice. So, Very nice. Uh, and it's a lot of juggling, right? You got the sports and then the classes and the travel. Like, how do you, how do you work yeah. all that out? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, uh, you know, at Monmouth, juggling school, football, you know, and even work, uh, yeah, it's, it's what we all had to do. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, you know, being a physics major there, it's magnified, right? Because you're spending, you know, honestly, extra hours on homework. Um, there's a ton of labs you got to take to get the degree. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, that that all keeps going during the football season, right? It, it doesn't stop mm -hmm. for games. Um, so I think out of what, probably 120 players on the team, I think any given year, we had at most two or three of us that were doing the physics route. Okay. Um, 
but yeah, there were there are absolutely times where it was difficult and uh, led to a lot of midnight oil being burnt. Um, <laughs> you know, because even though uh, I went to a smaller school, you know, a lot of the time demands are this are the same as a D1 That's school same. or similar to a D1 school, right? Because you you know you practice the same amount of days, you have to go to film, um, and you still got to balance that with the full course load. Um, so it, it was a lot, but you know I'm I'm ultimately very grateful for the experience yeah. uh, because, you know, even in terms of my professional life now, because, you know, I didn't just get to learn time management. I had to learn time management. Yeah. That's cool. And, you know, when you think about, I mean, a position like a fullback, there's a lot of plays that are running through you. So there's teamwork, there's leadership. Mm -hmm. And I imagine that those things transcend into the way you do business now, right? You're probably pulling from some of those lessons I'd imagine. Yeah, right. So, I mean, kind of like you're alluding to there, uh, you know, being a fullback uh, can be a selfless position. Um, going, you know, back to the football and uh, talking through some of the leadership aspects, I guess, um, you know, being a fullback, yeah, you're selfless, but, you know, you're also, uh, you know, a part of the team, you're out there with everybody else. And, um, in terms of leadership, uh, understanding how to um, overcome and you know really lead through adversity uh, is is hugely important, and it's you know a big part of it. And you know part of that's having a short memory. So hmm. uh, a former coach of mine really preached not being too high on the highs or too low on the lows, and that's something I've taken forward in life. And you mm -hmm. know it's. That, that, that applies to every day. It applies to training, you know, getting through the daily, the weekly, the monthly grind. Uh, playing football taught me that, you know, you don't need to only, you know, you don't have to just reset, you know, your day at some point. You know, sometimes you got to reset after the next play if you're going to have any kind of success. Yeah. So you can apply that mindset to engineering, you know, you know, pretty simply, right? You know, so you you make an error in a calculation or you miss something in a construction submittal um, that, you know, later seems like, you know, how obvious, like, how did I, how did I miss that? So, uh, you know, it's just, you know, the little mistakes, you know, you have to be able to accept it. You got to be able to learn from it and then reset, you know, have that short memory. So, um, you know, being able to project and instill that mindset and a team that you might be leading, you know, it's, it's, it's a crucial part of leadership. I, I'd agree with that stuff. And there are so many times, especially as geotechs, right? You have black, you have white, but then there's so much gray area in what we do, right? Because it's soil, it's rock, it's <laughs> better, you know, water. And oftentimes you, you have a tough day in the field and some folks that stays with them. And I, I have some folks are on, um, I've dealt with, they've, They've kind of overcome this, but I think about earlier in their career and it's like they had a bad Monday. I already knew they're going to have a bad week, right? It was like, hey, I'm gone. Like I've lost you for the week. And I remember mm -hmm. trying to explain that you're right. You have to, I like the concept of the short memory. It's like, you have to let it go and then move forward. <laughs> you're right. Yeah. It's I mean, so there's, important. yeah, you're going to have small mistakes. You might have big mistakes, but mm -hmm. um yeah, you got to you got to learn from it and keep moving, right? Work work goes on, life goes on. Yeah. All right, cool. So I mean, it's it's good to hear. I've I've hired a number of uh student athletes and, and I've heard a lot of stories about how yeah, you know, what you learn as an athlete, it stays with you for your um career and um, you know, maybe become a leader. You kind of draw from those experiences. So pretty cool to hear uh you're echoing the same I'd love to hear more about, I understand you worked on the Cedar Rapids project in, in Iowa and, um, yeah. you know, we're, we just dealt with, uh, you know, hurricane Ida. Some of, of us are uh, still mopping out the basements, but, um, you know, that's a city where you have consistent annual flooding, right? Can you tell us more about your involvement on the project? Yeah. So, um, to the point of the consistent flooding, they were hit pretty hard back in 2008, which <clears throat> eventually led to, um, them being, uh, receiving supplemental funding, um, disaster, long-term disaster relief supplemental funding, huh. um, that was put in place about three years ago, um, to help put in, into place a flood risk management system, you know, a levy flood wall system. 
Um, but my role in the project is as the geotechnical lead um, for the Corps of Engineers. Uh, I got into that role right away when the project got spun back up in 2018. Um, and in my role, uh, I cover the east side of the, the project. So the Cedar River splits Cedar Rapids. Um, so we have an east side project, west side project. Um, the overall project uh, is shared responsibility between the Cedar, city of Cedar Rapids and the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. Um, it's about a $550 million project, I think, were the initial estimates overall for, for everything. But uh, the Corps' main involvement uh, to date has been on the east side. And as the geotech lead, um, you know, I've provided geotechnical oversight to a very diverse team of you know, the Rock Island District. Um, we have other districts within the Corps that have done work on it. Uh, St. Paul is actively working on a reach. Uh, St. Louis was involved early on. Um, and then also several design contracts are being done by AE firms or, you know, private engineering firms. Um, so so it's, it's a big responsibility in kind of coordinating all that effort. Um, but in, in the process, um, I've been able to develop project project specific geotechnical design guidance. Um, so, you know, we're looking at seepage, slope stability, foundations, that sort of stuff to maintain consistency and, you know, follow core guidance. Uh, I've also um, been involved in the reviews of all projects from a geotechnical standpoint. Um, and then one of the, the major tasks early on was leading the geotechnical investigations. Um, so this project had been through feasibility, um, you know, between five and 10 years ago. And we had some data, but not nearly enough to design a project of this magnitude. So, so part of my role was, you know, uh, working with local testing and drilling agency uh, to, to get all this new information, which ended up being, you know, well over 300 points. And when I say points, I'm talking about borings or CPTs. <laughs> so it's all of that, plus the, the testing and data that comes from it. So um, it's been just about everything geotech you can possibly think of, um, from getting the data, communicating the data. Um, I even uh, was the lead designer on one of our levee reaches, so that was a pretty cool nice. experience too to, you know, kind of get into a team um, instead of just being kind of the coordination coordination role. Got it. Um, got it. And so, are there like multiple? consultants that like for those 300 points was that work that was awarded to a handful of consultants or did you have like one so that was responsible yeah okay. yeah sorry that was uh that was one uh company terracon there in cedar rapids okay did the work for that so they they, they were busy for a little over a year oh, um, definitely. i think other contracts we had um i think maybe stan tech did uh some of it but it was it was primarily terracon on this project who did did a great job the guys Got in their it. cedar rapids office are they, they really great to work with excellent excellent and you know this project itself i mean how long is i mean where are you in this where are you in the project in the beginning towards the middle it was a long lead i mean it sounds like a pretty big project yeah, yeah, it's, dollar, it's a, that it's dollar a amount's one. pretty massive. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's a it's it's a big one. It's the biggest one we've done in Rock Island for a long time. But uh, okay. we've been at it for about three years now, and I would say we're getting near the end of design. Um, however, we have started some of the projects in construction in the last year. Um, so I would I would consider us somewhere near the halfway point. Mm -hmm. um, um, but it's, it's a really interesting time right now to kind of be wrapping up designs for some parts and, you know, seeing some parts start to get built. Yeah. Uh... And, and, and what, what happens when you're, um, you know, when you're putting together a project of that scale, right. And then people start talking about sea level rise, global warming. I mean, there are times that you kind of look back at the plans and say, we need to rethink things or like, I mean, I guess, yeah, I mean, right. Cause it's already tied to funding that's been allotted but how does right. that work right yeah so you have i mean you essentially get a finite amount of money to work on this project you know you might have to modify that down the road but um 
you know, these, these supplemental projects are, are supposed to be on a very tight schedule. And if, if things come up that say, oh, you know, I don't know, maybe the hydraulic modeling shows something different than it did three years ago, you know, we got yeah. more data and we need to update it. You know, you just, you address those things as efficiently as you can. And um, you just, you have to be adaptable and, you know, willing to take a step back and think about it um, because it's, you know, it's, it's a system, right? It's, even if you're building one part and a part, another parts in design, it, in the end, when the whole project's complete, it, it it's it better work. So it better work exactly. You, know, <laughs> you just yeah, you got to be adaptable to these these sort of things. Got it, got it, got it. Okay, cool. And I know that you were um, you were involved with the rebuilding of levees after the 2019 Midwest flooding, and that affected nearly 14 million people. So for listeners that might not be familiar with what happened, can you explain that and also talk about your involvement for rebuilding those levees? Yeah, so in 2019, uh, there's pretty widespread flooding in the Midwest. Uh, we we're affected pretty heavily here in the Mississippi River Basin, uh, but also the Missouri River had some very substantial flooding and, you know, maybe even the Ohio. Um, hmm. So it's... A, you know, a very big part of the country that, yeah. that we're dealing with these floods. And, um, you know, speaking for my um, area of responsibility here along the Mississippi, Illinois rivers, Des Moines River, that, that part of the country, you know, a lot of this was driven largely by ground conditions being uh, heavily saturated and that's because we had a cold and wet fall a cold and wet winter and then we got some more rain in the spring and early summer um, so it was it was a perfect storm for flooding and on in, in that sense um, but you know kind of as you mentioned these you know the damages uh, from from this flood were were huge well into the billions I think um, the ASCE estimated like 20 billion hmm. um, and and uh, economic damage um, and it really you know this probably doesn't even capture the full scale because you know there are longer term costs that aren't realized until years later you know things that m might not get addressed so mm -hmm. um, it was it was a very very big deal and um, my involvement with the flood was really two-pronged because you know working for the Corps we get involved in the flood fight so um, and on the Upper Miss and Rock Island District, you know, that's something we do when a flood comes. We're immediately getting out there and supporting uh, the local stakeholders, uh, local levy sponsors and, you know, assisting them, giving them technical guidance, you know, the best we can. Um, and in my area, specific sub area, I guess, uh, down by Quincy, Illinois, um, they experienced, I think, the third highest flood on record. Um, wow. Looking back, I think 2008 and 1993 were slightly higher, um, but it was also spread. It was kind of unique that there were two different crests that were about a month apart. So it was it was a long fight. Wow. Um, and, and during that time, um, there was one night in particular uh, where it was right near the, the second major crest where we were actively fighting a levee that was eroding into the river. And mm. Um, you know, it was a really, um, I learned a lot from the experience because, you know, first you're getting to see actual performance, you know, of, of a levy, you know, you're, you're getting to see what we're designing for, yeah. but more importantly, you got to see, you know, the community down there, how they re respond when, when times are getting pretty tough, getting pretty wow. serious. You know, there were probably 50 local citizens on the levy that night. Um, I don't know how far they came from, but yeah. I mean, this is this is folks getting out at midnight to 3 a.m. to throw wow. sandbags, put poly over a levy. Wow. Um, and, and, you know, had we not had that help, you know, maybe we would have lost the levy. And, you know, a lot of not only industry that was behind that levy, but also the homes and, and folks that might not have been able to get out. So it was, um, yeah, definitely an impactful experience and um, some, some I'll, I'll certainly never forget. Yeah. Now, now, how does one coordinate that fight? I mean, is it, are people getting text messages to say, meet us at the levee? Like, how are you coordinating that? Is that something that you have trial runs every month? I mean, 
does that look yeah, like? Yeah, so so for from the core side, um, our district emergency management agency coordinates uh, the different team members for the different flood areas, uh, and, and that's a pretty tried and true method. You know, it's hey, you guys need to be down here, but in terms of folks that are already in the area, it's you know somebody gets their cell phone out, starts calling everybody they know, and uh, you know, yeah. hey, we're not doing so good out here, and you know the people show up, right? Because <laughs> wow. they care. So it's, <laughs> I, I don't know their full communication process, but it's yeah. you know, get everybody you can. Wow, that's awesome. That's awesome. I, uh, I I worked in New York for many years, and um, I remember around the time of when Superstorm Sandy happened, and you know, I can remember people were struggling to get the floodgates constructed because you know they just weren't ready some projects were under construction and some of the floodgates weren't high enough and you were hearing stories of water just toppling over because it, they just weren't high enough so um it's a lot to think about where do you where do you store your sandbags like how do you coordinate that effort that's that's uh we appreciate the work you're doing yeah it it takes a lot of planning and it takes a lot of people that's for sure yeah yeah and and when you say the fight like if if the crest if, there, if there's a month between, then you're not sleeping, right? I mean, yeah, no, I mean, there are, there are people down there. It looks like it's going down, but not yeah. far enough. So we keep people on site and, you know, ready to react if needed. I mean, luckily with the Mississippi being such a big um, basin, you, you're forecasting, um, you, you know, you can, you can project river rise, you know, multiple days out. So that, that helps but you know it was it was such that you know we just kind of had to wait for the next one waited out and you know it just took a turn back up so Got it. It, was, Got it was very unique wow well, what are some of the emergency procedures to follow during floods and, and what should people not be doing during floods i mean this, this might be stuff that people know that flood a lot but for people that don't you might it, i would tell my kids it's like we have parts of the nation to flood all the time we have other places that are like in droughts but like, what are things yeah. that people need to be thinking about? Um, so, you know, preparing for floods, to me, it, so much of it boils down to risk communication. <laughs> um, you know, when you're working on a project or managing a project that, or living behind a project even, that's intended to, to manage flood risk or, you know, w work as a flood control structure, you know, it's, it's important that you know, everybody that could be affected by a failure knows, you know, the extent of what could happen. <laughs> um, so by having that general awareness, you know, you're more able to handle these extreme events when the time comes because you have, you're, you know, you're able to have a plan in place that everybody understands, um, you know, and in terms of levees, flood walls, you know, this could be as simple as somebody you know, knowing that they're in the floodplain, but um, also being able to um, have your plan in place from, you know, an organizational side, from the core side or from a city or local flood district to know, okay, hey, this road closure needs to go in this many days before the flood reaches 20 or the river reaches 20 foot or, you know, having pumps staged, you know, a, a week in advance and knowing that they run, you know, it's, it's, these things, it's, it's so important to, to understand your system. And, and, you know, I've seen from the core side, so much emphasis put on risk, risk communication in the past few years. And, you know, it's for good reason. Just the last two uh, big dam risk assessments that I did these past two years, you know, I've seen updates to these risk assessments, uh, looking at their consequences that have revealed, you know, hey, we were previously underestimating um, our population at risk by an order of magnitude. Wow. Um, and, you know, at times some of these communities weren't aware of what a real flood looked like. Um, so, you know, as we continue to develop in flood plains, whether that be commercial, residential, you know, whatever reason you name it, um, you know, it's just drives home that point that, you know, we'd really, we really need to be communicating that risk. And that's, you know, awareness is, is what's really going to make a big difference in the end. Got it. Got it. Prevention and awareness. And what would you say for engineers? Like what can engineers do to help prevent and maybe even minimize the flooding of dams and levees? 
Well, unfortunately, we can't really prevent floods, right? Because <laughs> uh, nature, nature is an inevitable force. Yeah. Um, but you know what we can do, right? Is we can work towards minimizing the damage by managing our risk. Um, and you know that's not only the things like the communication measure, measures that are you know non-structural, but you know, as engineers, right, our, you know, we can we can minimize risk with our structural components of systems as well, you know, so that we're ensuring that we're designing the best systems, you know, we possibly can. That's, you know, that's where a lot of times we come in. Um, and, you know, and being able to, to make our systems better uh, comes from continuously learning from these events and applying the data to, you know, improve our decisions, improve our methods. Um, and, you know, that's something too that comes not only in practice, but in research, um, because, you know, it's not just the folks working every day on dams and levees that are, you know, learning these lessons. We've got, you know, so many people in academia that think about this on a daily basis, right? Looking at, you know, flood risk, looking at climate change, these things that, you know, are going to impact our future. Um, so, you know, when these different worlds, the different disciplines of, you know, you know, hydraulics, geotech structures, but, you know, also, I guess the different worlds of academia and practice come together, you know, to make solutions, um, you know, we're, we're only going to improve the way we do business as engineers. So I guess the main point to drive home is, you know, if we we got to take the real data and learn from it, you know, and, and not be afraid to change and adapt. Uh, makes a lot of sense. Makes a lot of sense. Uh, before we take our break, what's another piece of advice you'd like to leave for our engineers? And we have folks that are on the line that are students in college and grad school all the way through to, you know, professionals, you know, 20 plus years in the business. What advice would you give them as it relates to floods or developing one's career? Yeah, so this is a this is a popular one on the show, but um, you know, raise your hand when the opportunity arises, uh, and you know, do it fast because this is how opportunities are generated that you know propel your experience and knowledge, and subsequently your career. Um, and you know, with that, sometimes you know you need to push for the opportunities. Putting your hand up might. Um, might also mean saying to your supervisor, hey, I'm interested in working on this type of project. Um, because at the same time, nobody's going to read your mind. So, you know, how are they going to know what you're interested in? So that's, you know, that's my biggest piece of advice is to get out there and try things. Um, but also, I guess kind of a second part would be to never stop learning. Um, in the geotechnical field, especially, we're constantly learning new methods and applying new technologies to, you know, assess what we can't see. So, you know, take the time read the journal articles, get the ad additional education, uh, it's only going to pay off because at the end of the day, you know, whether you're working on piles or embankments or geosynthetics, um, the, the the soil mechanics is going to tie together. Excellent. That's so true. You know, when you sign up to be a geotechnical engineer, you've signed up for a lifetime of learning. <laughs> so yep. It's like super it's always critical. changing. Always changing. <laughs> We're going to come back and in just a minute and close this one out with Stefan in our career factor safety end segment. Stick around. Today, of course, we're speaking with Stefan Flynn. Stefan, you've already had a very successful career. And when you look back at your career, what's one thing that you implemented in your career to give yourself, let's call it a factor of safety in your career? So for me, it's, you know, finding ways to turn off your technical mind, right? Now, I'm, I'm not talking about long breaks to prevent burnout. You know, those are important too, but, you know, just kind of the micro breaks in your day. Uh, find a hobby that allows you to clear your head. Uh, for me, that's going to the gym. You know, when, when I'm at the gym, I'm only thinking about my next lift or exercise, and that's where I can honestly block out the noise of the day to day. Um, and that's the stuff that really keeps us balanced as we're trying to have fast paced careers, trying to continue to, to move up the ladder, because, you know, if it's if it's just work, it's, you know, you you will burn out. But, you know, you can't you can't wait months at a time to do that. You got You got to find ways to do that, you know, every day, a couple times a week. So that's that's the main thing for me for continuing to move on. Excellent. That's so important, especially now when folks are doing this 
hybrid, you know, working from home, sometimes working from the office, it's really easy to just forget to take a break. So thank you so yeah. much for that. <laughs> Absolutely. All right, great. Well, Stefan, thank you so much for coming on and for sharing all the great insights you did. You shared information. I know it's going to be really good advice for our listeners. And if a listener wanted to find you, what's the best way for them to reach out to you? Email or social media? Uh, for me, getting a hold of me through LinkedIn, um, that I'm pretty responsive to messages on there. Uh, okay. You know, email as well. Um, either way, but LinkedIn's probably the quickest way to get a hold of me. All right, excellent, excellent. And what is your email too? Uh, email is Stefan S T E F A N dot G dot Flynn F L Y N N at USACE dot Army dot mil excellent excellent needs a few more letters it's pretty long <laughs> yeah, yeah we'll make sure to get uh, it in the know, show notes <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah we we like our acronyms but still <laughs> not always the best with brevity <laughs> that's awesome that's awesome but thank you so much for coming on this is great <laughs> yes i've enjoyed it appreciate it i hope you enjoyed the episode today we would love to hear your feedback comments and or questions please feel free to go to geotechnicalengineeringpodcast.com where you'll find a summary of the key points discussed in today's episode, that being episode 40, as well as links to any of the resources, websites, or books mentioned during this episode. Until next time, I wish you the very best in all your geotechnical engineering endeavors. Peace.